Um, we have an, a really impressive panel of folks who are kind of the movers and shakers of the Detroit air quality scene, so to speak, in, uh, in Metro Detroit. And I'm going to uh, give them each a brief opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Nina Ignazic. I'm the founder and editor of Planet Detroit. We're at planetdetroit.org and we are a, a nonprofit news organization focused on covering health and environment issues that matter to Detroiters. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Darren Riley to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. And thank you so much, Nina, Nina, for all you do and reporting the, the real news and the, and, and all the, the reports and stuff from Planet Detroit. Um, uh, but yeah, Darren Riley, founder, CEO of Just Air, really an organization, really bent on making sure that everyone has access to clean air, which I'm um, excited to be here and share more of our learnings. But um, yeah, thrilled to be a part of this community. I live in Detroit, Southwest Detroit, um, and excited to, to share more. I'll pass it on to uh, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, Jeff Gearhart. I'm with the Ecology Center. We're a, a nonprofit research and advocacy organization with offices in Ann Arbor and Detroit and uh, work a lot with all of the wonderful people on this call. I will um, send it over to Kathleen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Nina, for putting this together. I'm really happy and proud to be here with you. Um, I'm from the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, the Michigan chapter, Kathleen Sloniger. Um, I'm also a registered nurse and certified asthma educator, and um, my agency is celebrating 40 years of serving Michiganders this year. And so what we do is provide information and education around asthma and allergy issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn it over to June. Ah, good afternoon. My name is June Mack. I'm the president of Winship Community Improvement Association. I'm also involved with Disaster Recovery Group and Feeding the Neighborhood Corporation on the east side, which we'll expand into the west side. And I have a class that I instruct every Thursday at WC3 on South Carolina Drive for seniors to teach them how to use a computer. All right, so June, we're gonna start with you. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to, to be with us today. Um, so you have a history with asthma. Can you tell us about when you started noticing your symptoms and how it's impacted your life? Actually, I was born with asthma. And as, as, for as far as, as far back as I can remember, it mm -hmm. would be certain things that I would eat would bring on my wheezing. Mm -hmm. um, if I ran too much or was in a field of grass, and they would bring on my asthma, I would start wheezing. And I was always told that I would grow out of it by my grandparents and my great grandparents and my mother. Mm -hmm. And here lately in the last three years, I found out that I would never grow out of it. And I'm 72 years old and that is a disease and nothing that I can grow out of. And so, so have you, have you, know, have you been able to manage your symptoms throughout your I life? Or is it been I um, stay away from things that I'm allergic to. And I, when I find that I have problems breathing, I avoid areas that have different odors. Different perfumes bring on miasma sometimes. You know, pops. I drink water <laughs> and tea, you know, and uh, and different materials also. When I buy things, I have to wash them. I cannot just buy them and wear it. I have to wash the dyes out. The dyes bring on things. And I go in people's homes. That way I work, you know, when I'm the work that I'm doing, they have mold. I can smell it like when I, you know, I can, it makes my chest heavy. I feel the weight on my lungs. When I go into their homes, I wear a mask or one of those respirator masks and stuff. You know, we're doing a thing with Disaster Recovery Group, and people get mold in their houses from yeah. the water being backing up in their basement, mold and mildew. And yeah. that's what we're working on, trying to get them cleaned up and get them healthy. And they don't understand how come they have lung problems. Some have black mold in their ears from the mold in their homes. Some have it in their lungs. Yeah. So, But I am... I, um, I try to stay away from things that make my asthma flare up because I know me. Yeah. And so you've, you've had to figure that out over your whole life. Yes, I have. Okay. Darren, you, uh, you also have asthma, I understand. And you, um, you kind of use your personal experience to make a company. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, 
Well, that's for Darren. That's you, you, can, you can do it too, though. <laughs> you can talk too, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate you, June, and um, uh, and yeah, um, kind of echo, um, you know, that experience as well. So I didn't grow up with asthma. Um, uh, originally from Houston, Texas. Um, athlete throughout my life, and so uh, breathing never had was second thought. You know, I had friends and peers who may have had you know issues around asthma. Um, it wasn't until 2018, um, so it says, man, I'm getting old, uh, six, uh, six years ago, um, I lived in Southwest Detroit uh, when I moved here, um, that I started um, uh, kind of feeling these flare-ups or what I didn't know was asthma. Um, it, but I remember it was a critical period, I think it was around uh, like a summertime. Um, I played basketball in a local church here and I couldn't really get up and down the court. I had to sleep like perpendicular because I realized that you know if I was laid down the gravity just the phlegm and everything built up I literally couldn't breathe drinking water all the coughing I thought it was like I had bronchitis or something I don't know what was going on it took me a while like a week and I was like literally suffering probably having acute asthma attacks frequently and so I went to the doctor and they did the test and said they you know um, you know, you have asthma. Um, so it came really sudden and probably reflecting on it probably was like slowly building up to that point, I would assume. But that was the experience that I was dealing with. Um, but what really hit uh, a nerve for me, my background is in technology. So I'm a uh, can, uh, software engineer uh, by trade. And I've always been fascinated on how we use technology to actually um, unroot some systemic issues, you know, in communities, whether it be, you know, economic poverty, some of the health issues, such as air quality that we're working on. And so never thought about building an organization around this work, um, and it, but it wasn't until COVID um, where, you know, I was like, you know, what do we have to lose? You know, with George Floyd um, that was going on, the COVID uh, mortality deaths hit black and brown communities the most. A lot of my loved ones passing away. Um, was like, you know, there's limited time on earth, you know, we got to do something about it. And so air quality was one of those things that underlined some of the lung diseases um, that uh, made it more likely for people to pass away from COVID. So um, that's when I really was like, all right, let's see what's going on and how do we get more data and make sure that these health disparities are in our community. So yeah. I know it's a little bit of a rhythm, but that's kind of, you know, why we do our work and um, why we'll, we'll make sure we kind of root some of those injustices. Yeah, and we're going to get more into uh, your company and the data that you're collecting uh, later on in our talk. But first, I'm going to uh, let Kathleen tell us a little bit about um, the work that she does. And Kathleen, do these these stories are things that you've heard in the past a lot in your work. Can you tell us, you know, what you're seeing in terms of asthma in the Detroit area? Sure. So. Yeah, asthma in Southeast Michigan and especially Detroit is is among the highest uh, across the state and and in fact across the country. And you know what June and and Darren have been experiencing is replicated among Detroiters over and over and over again. Um, you know, in all the years that we've been working in the area, um, these are the stories that we're hearing. And and I have to tell, I have to be honest with you, we can teach people about their medication, we can teach them about their um, disease process and how to remove triggers in the home. But there's a lot that contributes to more asthma cases and worse asthma in the air quality. And so how am I supposed to help people um, get rid of that trigger when there's so many policies in place and so many industries happening that we don't have a lot of control over? Mm -hmm. So we have dedicated more um, uh, efforts in the last few years to trying to change policy, because truly that's that's going to be one of the big ways that we can improve the air quality of what's going on. But to kind of expand on what June and Darren were experiencing is um, asthma and allergy foundation does um, an asthma capitals report every year. And last year, Unfortunately, Detroit ended up in the first spot. That meant we were the worst place to live in the country. If you Do had you want asked, me to bring that up for you, or yeah, would you? Yeah. Um, and and a little good sign though. This year we did move into the fifth worst spot, so that's still pretty bad. We we need to get better on these numbers. But what the Asthma Capitals report highlights is how hard it is for people with asthma to to live in certain cities, and then you'll notice a lot of those where cities are the ones in the more industrial aspects of the country. 
And that's exactly what goes on in Detroit is, is the industry, you know, contributes to a lot of the air pollution, which contributes to more asthma cases and people getting worse asthma symptoms. Um, asthma uh, capitals has also um, allowed us to explore more of why that goes on in Detroit. And so I think the work that Darren does and what we're gonna hear about what Jeff does really contributes to us being able to make these changes that are necessary through individual modification, but as well as policies. Um, so I think uh, people should pop into the Asthma Capitals 2023 report and take a look, um, see why cities get placed in these worst areas like Detroit and um, what you can do to try to improve the conditions. Got it. And we will uh, we'll share all of these links out um, with all of the attendees afterwards. Um, I'm going to stop share just to make sure I don't turn us off the webinar. <laughs> so lastly, we're going to go to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, what you've been studying this for a while in your role with Ecology Center. What what are we facing in terms of air quality in Detroit and what's driving it? Oop, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks, Nina. Uh, I think I'll. I, I think important to recognize I, I, our approach to this work is really based on um, bringing a broader environmental health perspective, which focuses both on human health and ecological health, and. When we start bringing that perspective to this work in terms of understanding community health, you pretty quickly get to the point where you realize air quality is one of the critical components to determining health outcomes and impacts, but it's not the only one. And I think as Kathleen was mentioning, we know that there are uh, significant historic social factors, uh, historic racism, historic uh, reasons why we have poor housing stock, the reasons why we have overburdened communities that are being impacted by multiple issues, and that that has a profound impact on health. And air quality uh, uh, both exacerbates and is a trigger in that and and that's why you know increasingly we want to look at these issues in an all-encompassing way. So I, uh, there's been a number of efforts over the last decade to try to look at how do we integrate in environmental exposure measures and environmental effects with uh, measures of sensitive populations as well as socioeconomic factors that impact this. So um, Michigan has a wonderful tool, the Michigan EJ screen that actually uh, does that for the state of Michigan. Uh, EPA has a tool and there's other tools out there that use these data sets to uh, look at areas that are overburdened from these perspectives. And so when we talk, think about air quality and the impact, it's within that context. And the system for which we're trying to address health on a community basis is fragmented at best. And I would characterize it as broken in some important ways in terms of being able to address the on the ground health concerns that exist in the community. So part of that is really going to be addressing these air quality concerns um, that are profound and really important. And then part of that is really uh, we need to re-envision our regulatory system uh, in terms of how we approach addressing health in our communities. And Jeff, there's a there's a new uh, standard that EPA is trying to uh, put forward regarding particulate matter or soot. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, there's been an effort over the last uh, quite a few years to reevaluate the PM 2.5 standard that applies nationally. Uh, EPA just recently announced that they were going to lower the yearly limit from 12 micrograms per cubic meter to 9 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, that is going to um, be a significant change uh, in terms of what parts of the state are going to be in non-attainment for meeting that standard. And I think the preliminary analysis that 
ourselves and our colleagues have done show that there's going to be significant parts of the state. A lot of our major cities are going to have compliance problems based on existing data that's out there and that we are going to be in non-attainment. Uh, that opens up a number of opportunities. Uh, there's that brings in additional requirements in permitting, um, moving from a uh, higher level of control technology, moving from best available control technology to lowest achievable emission reduction uh, in terms of evaluating permits. And it also requires the state to create a plan to get into attainment mm -hmm. and to address sources that are contributing to uh, the exceedance of that standard. So that is something that uh, our communities and the state is going to be dealing with in the in the coming years. Okay. And I just wanted to be clear. Um... You know, when we talk about air quality, the, the Clean Air Act has made a difference, right? I mean, we have cleaner air than we did in 1970. Is that true? But we're still we're still just not where we need to be. That's a question for anybody. anybody? Who wants to... Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll respond. Go ahead, Darren. I would say, um, I mean, I think the uh, short answer is, I believe, yes. Uh, the, other uh, answer is that I think we're just starting to realize how deeply air quality impacts in unique ways, um, even new studies around education and um, brain development in early childhood, right? These yeah. are things that are coming out. So yes, while you know, we're decreasing over time and, and trending, I think we're still not where we need to be given the new information around the health impacts around air pollution. Yeah, and I'm just bringing up this uh, this graph just to show uh, when we reported on ozone earlier this year, you know, we were asked to put this in context. So yes, these these pollutants have come down, um, but they're still causing problems. And like yeah, Darren said, I think we're just starting to appreciate what those are. Um, these new EPA regulations though will will help. Um, you know, we're we're definitely going to see less cases of asthma. Some of the estimates show almost six thousand less cases and a lot less asthma exacerbations where people feel worse by mm -hmm. 800,000. So even that shift from 12 to nine mm -hmm. really reduces the, the particulate pollution. So mm -hmm. people's health will improve. And that's what we have to keep doing is, is making these legislation rules to keep improving things. So Darren, let's shift to just air and um, tell me a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about what, what it is you do and maybe starting with what we're looking at here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think I, I do want to start with um, just kind of building on what I was saying earlier with the reasons of starting just air, obviously my personal experience, but um, I think even broader than that. Uh, just how important it is to make sure that we manage air quality well within our environments to what extent we can do so. Um, and, and what do I mean by that? Um, there are studies that show that air pollution caused more deaths within a year than uh, war, caused more deaths than cigarette smoke, more deaths than uh, car crashes. Um, and so uh, just understanding that, you know, cutting people's lives short um, uh, due to some of these these elements and, and the impact on our health um, does impact our economy, right? Um, the U.S., uh, there's an estimate that the, it call, air pollution costs the U.S. $600 billion um, yearly. Um, and so when we talk about, before I dive into what Just Air is all about, it's not just, you know, hey, you know, I'm suffering from asthma and everyone's, which is the most important thing, the human aspect of it. But also we're trying to move forward as a society um, and really make sure our communities are out there and put food on the table for their families. Um, that they can go to work, um, that kids can learn um, is super essential to make sure that we get this under control. So I just want to give that fabric of why we started just there. And I just, you know, I just from the anecdote of me developing this disease. Um, but what you see in front of you is um, our, our main product, which is really a public um, facing dashboard that everyone here has access to uh, at justair.app. You can sign up for alerts. Um, we're starting to actually build out a new platform where you actually can subscribe to monitors that are important to you. So maybe you don't care about this monitor on the east side and you're just worried about the monitors, you know, uh, down in the southwest or and, and monitors and more monitors to come. So kind of curating that experience. But you receive an air quality alert when things are bad. Uh, we show you 
uh, the air quality index on each dot localized and, and, and also pull out what pollutant is causing that issue, right? You know, if it's an ozone day, you know, maybe that's something where, um, hey, I, I want to think twice about mowing my lawn or, you know, if I don't have to pump my gas, maybe not choose that day because of those VOCs catalyzing with ozone. Uh, if it's a particular day, you know, say N95, you know, uh, make sure those fine particles don't enter our bloodstream and exaggerate asthma in certain cases. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and going forward, just to kind of make a, a quick announcement, we do have a, a really exciting project with the uh, County of Wayne, where we're deploying 100 uh, stationary monitors throughout the county, um, where people can subscribe and get real time throughout the 43 communities and the 15 districts throughout Wayne, um, that will give this more of a broader picture, right? So, you know, people in Hamtramck, um, obviously we have work in Dearborn already, um, think about Inkster um, and other places where, um, you know, this data can be more accessible. Um, and the last thing I will say, and I promise this is the last thing, because I say that all the time, um, is that um, a part of that project as well is um, we are doing a study, a private study uh, with 500 mobile monitors, and more information will come uh, for people who are interested. And we're also uh, equipping Bluetooth inhalers um, to where uh, when I have an exaggeration, I click my um, uh, 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 you know, trigger my medication, um, that triggers a location that's privatized, but also understand the local exposure. So the mobile monitor next to me will then show the pollutants of when I did that exaggeration. Um, and also the network of monitors around me, the closest monitor to exaggeration. So we look at exposure of what could cause those triggers. It's just to understand for me, for example, when I have my, you know, there's nothing in the world better than breathing and have those episodes of asthma. Um, it's nothing I can think about other than breathing. And then once I clear it, I'm not reflective of when I was having those triggers as much as I should be, as, as much mm -hmm. as my doctor wants me to be. So uh, while we're building technology, it's really assisted at. So you can imagine a map of, hey, all my exaggerations are coming from the gym or my school or my home, right? So we can start to pay more attention and try to alleviate some of those triggers that may be causing that. So um, all that to say is just there is building all types of technologies, really focused on making sure everyone has access to clean air and, and able to breathe more healthy um, uh, in environments. That's that's really so the 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 exposure data would go to you personally or would there be like a map where people are getting exposed also publicly? It's, pers it's personally. Um, that's just from HIPAA compliance and also right, right. Uh, we are working with uh, youth. Um, our intentionality is so I think that's a, a level of exposure. So the families who enter the study and the folks who have that personal mobile monitor and the personal inhaler connection um, mm -hmm. will have access to their own data. Um, and, the, and the county will be doing their own uh, research broadly that will be public about some of the what we learned. Um, so Recruitment will start here soon and it'll be more information. Well, we'll make sure you yeah, all that's know. really interesting. I'm on, I definitely want to learn more about that. Um, it just this so, so this map is live. This is showing uh, within like the last hour what the what the uh, air quality has been at these sites. Is that right? Yeah, so we do a rolling average air quality index. So we now cast so rolling 12 hours. Um, so what you see here in front of you, um, the last sample or last time this was updated is 11.42. So it's a rolling average since 11 a.m. And so once it hit 12 p.m., um, we have our next sample or average um, or at 12.30 probably, you'll see that update. So it's as real time as we can get. So this concentration, for example, 12.21, this is accurate as there's something that's happening right there. So as real time as we can get, um, mm -hmm. you know, to to make sure we are kind of getting that valid information. So we hear like it's also getting is getting worse. It's been getting yeah. worse. A lot yeah, of so What's going yeah, on? Yeah. So you can see. Yeah. That's a that's the point as well. Is um, when you're looking at this map, um, and this is something that we're getting better at and, and trying to improve upon in terms of the education piece. Is that uh, this tells one part of the story. The other part of the story, you know, as Jeff knows as well is you know what is really happening in that environment you know that's why we need sample data that's why we have you know if there's have heavy trucking traffic right um next to a school that gets out at 3 p.m and we see a spike we can assume that maybe parents are idling or buses are idling mm -hmm. that could that could be the context so this tells one part of the story but the other part of the story is really on the ground and and you understand your environment better than these monitors you see what's going on in your environment hey what that industry hey this trucks these trucks idle or Hey, these homes that you know, or maybe uh, need some updating. So, 
Um, but also one thing I'll note, and maybe kicked over to Jeff to maybe share more on the importance of make sure we have quality data, quality instrumentation um, when we do is reporting. So um, one thing we try to focus on is make sure um, the data that is available is uh, controlled, um, calibrated, um, make sure that we maintain these monitors and not reporting bad data that, you know, people are making decisions on. But I know Jeff is actually my guru and taught me a lot of these things. So <laughs> um, I'd love to, if he has any input on just like that whole infrastructure bit and monitoring. Well, I, I'll just comment that um, community-based monitoring has, you know, someone who's been doing this for decades in the last 10 years has really expanded incredibly around the country, around the world. And so it's, it's, uh, uh, there are a lot of people engaged in this work. Um, this is our Southeast Michigan project, but Darren's doing work in other parts of the state. We're doing work in other parts of the state and in other states doing this. So it's, it's a, a significant shift in in um, communities being able to generate their own data. Um, there's real challenges out there in terms of maintaining data quality and 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 working on those issues and 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 we're all kind of wrestling with that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the work has been really successful as a way to educate, engage uh, community members in understanding uh, what are some of the the kind of micro air quality impacts that may be happening in their neighborhoods. And then I think it's also, um, you know, particularly when we start looking at, um, you know, the PM standard being lowered and some other regulatory changes, I think the this additional monitoring helps add granular detail to the regulatory monitoring systems mm -hmm. and helps us try to understand places where we need more monitors. Where do we need more regulatory grade monitors? Where do they need to be? Um, and can help um, drive improvements in policy. So uh, I think I think it's an exciting set of work. Um, Darren's really been doing a great job leading leading up that work, but I think all of us are involved in, in different aspects of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really exciting. I'm gonna sh stop sharing now and we're gonna shift gears a little bit uh, because we wanna talk about, okay, we, we understand air quality is something that you know, there's big policy forces at work that we need to be um, looking at. But if you're somebody that has asthma, um, what, you know, what can you do to make sure that you are managing that condition to the best of, of your ability? And so Kathleen and June um, participated in a program to try to help make that happen. So Kathleen, could you start a little bit just by telling us what that program is? It's called HEAL. What does that stand for? What does that mean? So before I jump into that, and I want to talk about that, I do also want to mention that my agency, Asthma and Allergy Foundation, has uh, received a grant from the EPA for, of the United States. We're working with Wayne State University and also doing some air monitoring in Detroit uh, for seniors. And we're lucky enough to be able to put a monitor in the home as well as outside the home. So this is going to add to the database that that Darren and, and Jeff use in their analysis and uh, I think that's going to enhance really what what um, uh, medical folks can do to help people then when we understand the impacts of of what's going on in the environment. Very and cool. and one other issue is we people have to understand that pollution not only affects people with respiratory illness, but we know now that pollution what it does to the body with its toxins can affect heart disease, can affect diabetes, mm -hmm. can affect uh, maternal and fetal mortality, and so many other chronic health issues. So it's just not for respiratory, which is bad enough. Now, if you add in all those others. So it's so important that we're having this discussion today and that we are going to talk about some solutions um, like this HEAL program that the Asthma and Allergy Foundation um, was lucky enough to receive a grant for so that we could really impact people in the Detroit area help them understand the disease process, help them understand what they can do about it. Mm -hmm. um, but HEAL itself stands for Health Equity Advancement and Leadership. It's um, a fund that started from our national office to really drill down into the communities um, where um, these chronic illness 
problems happen the, the, the most, and especially in communities that have been historically um, disadvantaged and, and uh, uh, not received adequate health care, not received uh, the economic benefits and all these other things that we know are going on. So we developed our HEAL program to reach into those most impacted. And what it does is not only teaches folks about their asthma condition and how to make it better, but we know that, that chronic disease and health is kind of a whole, you need a holistic perspective and, and lifestyles need modification in order to improve the chronic condition. And so we've been able to offer folks not only the education, but access to um, exercise. So we give them free family memberships to the local YMCAs. You can go on site and they also have virtual. So there's no excuse because we know movement improves health. Mm -hmm. We also are able to provide um, nutrition support. So we give them visiting um, sessions with a certified nutritionist so they can talk about food and how that impacts their asthma and allergies and how that impacts their health in general. But we've also been able to offer them the fresh food that they need in order to, to, to make these improvements. So we've worked an arrangement with uh, the Eastern Market and our folks can come you know, twice a month and pick up the farm box um, and they can do that curbside. So it's really easy. Uh, another aspect of the HEAL program is that every time folks uh, accomplish a task in the program, they get a reward, but it's just not, any reward. They get a reward that's going to benefit their, their health. So they might get an air filter. Um, at some other point, they might get a water filter because we know water is not that great in, in Southeast Michigan. Um, we also have opportunities for them to receive um, allergy-friendly bedding and allergy-friendly cleaning products. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on from there. But another big impact of our program is that we have um, uh, tried to ensure that our folks visit with us the asthma specialist so that they can really get on the right track to um, uh, improving their asthma condition. And I wanted to, uh, I see you brought the, the story up about the heal that, that Planet Detroit did. And that's really great. Um, yeah, and Nina, yeah, there she is. So <laughs> um, I wanted to also, if I could share my screen, I wanted to bring yeah. up some of the Maybe after June talks, maybe June can to share about her experience and then I'll bring up some slides that really we've been doing the evaluation of the program so we can see how it has actually impacted folks. Okay, yeah, sounds good. So June, you participated in the HEAL program. What, did you win any prizes? What did you? No, I didn't win. I, I did everything <laughs> that they asked me to do. I went to an asthma allergy specialist. Yeah. Yeah, I found out that I never knew that I, I thought all these years that I was allergic to shrimp because when I would cook them, my fingers would swell, my lip would swell when I eat them, you know, I get bumped. And I found out that I wasn't because he told me I was allergic to, after all these, all these tests they give you with the needles and all that stuff they stick you with. I'm not allergic to shrimp. I'm allergic to what they, the preservative that they spray on the shrimp. Wow. And I didn't know that they were spraying preservatives on the shrimp. But I, I always soak, I used to, did not do that, soak it like I do now. But I soak all my chicken, my fish. I soak it with kosher salt and white vinegar. Mm -hmm. I soak my white potatoes after I cut them up and let them, let the potassium fall to the bottom of the bowl. I let mm -hmm. it and I pour that potassium off because I know it's not good for you. You know, mm -hmm. too much potassium. But I didn't know that. I learned that I wasn't allergic to shrimps and there's certain things that I can't eat certain things that I can't wear, certain things that I can't smell, but I'm, I'm allergic to grass, but I cut my grass. I wear a mask because mm -hmm. that's exercise. I do my snow. Mm -hmm. You know, but, I do things. I have a garden. I don't buy a lot of vegetables because I grow them. Mm -hmm. and so I Nina, you said, you said that, huh? Nina, you said that, that June won prizes. And, and again, they're not winning the prizes. I didn't they're win. I, I achieved them. I, you know, they just gave it to me. For yeah, yeah. The pillows, I love the pillows, okay? And the air cleaner. But are the pillows, so are they? I had they... a water filter on my whole house. I had already did that before the Flint episode. When I bought this house, I put a water filter on. I had it. We did it. And so my grass gets filled with water. Mm -hmm. That's what I water it. My vegetables get filled with water. I um, I know I got a lot of allergies and cats. People that have asthma should not be around a cat. 
Yeah, if you're allergic. You know, even dogs, oh, unless you got the dog with no hair. <laughs> they have dogs with no hair, you know, but they don't look good. So, June, did you say that you you didn't actually know that you had asthma before? I knew I had asthma, but I thought I was going to grow out of it from being told all my life. Yeah. I'm not from Michigan. I'm from New York. Okay. But I would go to Alabama to visit my grandparents. They would always tell me that I would grow out of it. Yeah. And I never grew out of it. It, it would I would just not have so many bad episodes all the time. Mm. But I did everything that kids do. I went, I went camping. I went skiing. I did all that stuff, but it would be limited because my breath would be short. And I mm -hmm. always had an atomizer. At that time, it was isoparel. You just buy it over the counter at the drugstore. Now everything is so expensive. But the main thing for, for getting to people about with asthma is education. You got to educate them. My uh, community association, I always hand out all these flyers from here. I make copies and I give it to them. I send it to my friends on the east side where I'm going to have Darren go because you met somebody over there, Darren, you don't remember them, but they are an uh, advocate over there on the east side here in Detroit. And um, I just, um, I tell everybody about it. I have asthma and cigarette smoke, perfumes. You spend all this money on perfumes and colognes and it'll bring on an asthma attack. Certain perfumes will have you in the emergency room. Certain foods, certain fruits, a lot of stuff. But but I so like for you for the heal program. What was the best part of it? What did you the test? I had to do all those tests. You like you would read each chapter. You know, Kathleen, those chapters. You have to answer those questions. I wrote them. <laughs> you you wrote those questions. <laughs> I did. It's a big book. Okay, and you have to go through. But I, you know, you have to answer. You do it. You take a test. So if you don't pass with the answers, they know you didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big book. It's a binder. Yeah. Did you, uh -huh. did you do the food as well? Did you pick up? Uh, I can't, I can't. A lot of the food that Easter market had, I don't eat. I can't. Oh. Eat. So if I got the box, I would give it away because there's okay. certain things that I can't eat. But I grow my own. I have a garden okay. <laughs> every year. Yeah. Let me pull up the survey results. Oh, I huh? I'm going to pull up the survey results. Okay. Because um, I know we're running short on time. Yeah, <laughs> there's the colors of the book. <laughs> So can you guys see my screen? Yes, yes, I can. Yep. I wanted to show you some of the results. And this is just preliminary data after six months of folks being involved in the HEAL project. Um, you can see that that in the beginning, they folks didn't really know how to manage their asthma. Only 48% said they were confident. And after just being in the program six months, that, that moved up to 70% feeling confident that they they could manage their asthma. And, and from 57% to identifying their triggers to 74%. So you can see just even after six months, um, people are getting a better understanding. Mm -hmm. They're seeing their, their asthma specialist or pulmonologist, look at that, that almost tripled. Mm -hmm. And the best part I need to focus is that they're not having to go to the emergency room or an unplanned doctor's visit by almost half, that dropped by half. And the hospitalizations also dropped by half almost. Mm -hmm. These are significant numbers and we're just now getting our 12 month data. So we should be seeing similar, um, Some there's no reason we shouldn't see even better numbers. Not um, only that Kathleen, I haven't had an asthma attack. Well, that's I've been good. That's the best part. Come yeah, coming up the basement stairs. I'm not anymore. That is the best part. That's the, and Brio, this new the new atomizer that he put me on, Brio, it works, and I'm I'm good. I'm good. I just watch what I eat and where I go. You know, that's and perfect to hear. I love I it. I try to educate people on asthma. I let them know yeah. about the field. I do. Yeah, and we actually started a second group um, just this year, and I have just a handful of openings left. Okay. So if there's anybody listening who um, thinks they would like to get involved, we've even expanded it to Wayne and Oakland County, okay. not just Detroit. Um, you have to be an adult over 18, have asthma, been affected by disparities in healthcare. Um, and other than that, it's a pretty, um, pretty open application process. You can go to our website at a A F A M I C H dot org 
and click on services and you'll get a link to the application. Okay, We'd great. Love to see more of you folks involved. Email, yep. All I right. did the exercises also via on Zoom with the oh, workout. I did that. I, I loved it. I loved it. I couldn't do the butterfly though. What kind of exercise was it? It was well, the, the YMCA also offers YMCA. a virtual exercise yes, program. Virtual. Okay, so like a uh, cat sitting class. That sounds fun. Oh, yeah. um, well, I'm so glad to hear that this, you know, made an impact for you, June, and that you haven't had an asthma attack. Um, I think, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in my reporting that just really struggle with it and struggle to find ways to deal with it. So I think, you know, what all of you are doing, both like trying to help people identify their triggers in the community and then educating folks on how they can, you know, get the help they need, the kind of medical attention, but also, you know, other things that they can do with their lives, um, their eating habits and, you know, their, their home environments. So where, where do we go from here? What, if, you know, if, if each of you could kind of wave a magic wand and say one thing would, you know, change over the next, you know, three to five years to make a real difference in this issue, what, what would it be? Continuing to educate people about asthma and trying to get to the powers that be to get them to regulate all this stuff in the air. Mm -hmm. You know, policy, change mm -hmm. policy. Change policy, okay. To adapt with the future and with healthcare. They need to be balanced. Mm -hmm. That's what I think, but if I could wave a wand, I would do it. Mm -hmm. Well, you're already happen. doing it, so you don't need to wave a wand. I continue. <laughs> Nobody yeah. else? Yeah, I'll jump in, June. Um, <clears throat> I think it's doing more of what you're already doing. Um, Nina, once again, just want to say I appreciate you highlighting this work and highlighting all these efforts that are happening around Detroit. Um, you know, I, I think, yeah, I thinking back to, you know, folks who've encouraged me in this space from Teresa Landrup, uh, Donna Wilkins, a lot of environmental justice leaders who've been doing this work far before I was born and continue to do this work, you know, and, and seeing people in their community pass away from things that um, you know, didn't, see, didn't achieve the oh. justice that they sought and they continue to fight for this work. So I always, uh, I think my biggest thing and encouragement is, you know, as you know, new generations come into this fold is continue to um, push the efforts because things are changing. This this particular matter standard, right? These new policies, new technologies, mm -hmm. uh, all the stuff that the Hill program is doing. I mean, that is outstanding to keep people out the emergency room. My father was just in the ICU uh, mm -hmm. during the holiday break because of asthma, right? So um, I, I think if I can bear, wave a magic wand is just to encourage, to stay encouraged because things are happening. So just keep that momentum and, and keep going. So that's my thought. I was just informed today about an ordinance some of our council people here in Detroit want to pass about having chickens, pigs, and all this stuff 30 feet away from each, per, each neighbor's house. I don't think that's healthy. Yeah, that's a controversy. I don't think that's healthy. And I don't think that people in the community know much about this because mm -hmm. I got the letter and I didn't pay any attention to it until it was brought to my attention. Mm -hmm. And so until this evening, although the weather's bad, I will be down at, at the city. Okay. With the one in the group. Jeff, what's your magic wand? <laughs> oh, you're muted no. again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I can't find my magic wand, so uh, I'll have to do uh do the best I can. I I do think just to highlight broad on the broader concern around air quality is we are going to be seeing impacts from uh climate change and that are going to be happening locally, regionally, and globally. Those are going to impact uh the levels of particulate matter particularly ground level ozone, which we haven't talked about that much here, but, and, um, you know, more extreme weather, more hot days, which are going to impact the chemistry, the atmospheric chemistry that are going to impact our air quality. So we need to continue to uh, evolve our regulatory paradigm on how we try to address these issues, because the way we do it now it, it is not able to address what people are really going to be experiencing, what they already are experiencing, and what what people are going to experience going forward in a in a in a changing atmosphere. 
And I think we need to look at, again, particularly if uh, the data shows we have profoundly overburdened communities. We need to ask serious questions about whether or not we're going to continue to allow new or expanded siting of industry in these areas. Um, these are really important questions because the system right now, um, we, we, we don't say no. And we know we have health impacted communities and we continue to permit and cite sources there. So really ask the questions on whether we need a pause on, on some of the new sources that are being put in until we have a handle on this. Um, and then, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about uh, regulatory requirements is how do we move beyond beyond what's what's in the regulatory requirements? How do we look at new state laws that address some of these issues, uh, things that we can actually do in Michigan? So I'm hoping in three to five years we've made progress on that. Kathleen, any any anything anybody hasn't said yet in your wand? Yeah, I do want to mirror what Jeff is saying about the climate because um it's important that each individual and business starts to really, you know, move in that that direction. We all we all need to use clean, renewable energy sources. And the interesting thing about making these shifts is that they impact the health in a positive way very quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas these changes take a little longer to impact the actual climate. Mm -hmm. So by making these changes to more of a green and, and renewable economy and energy use we're going to see the health impacts a lot sooner than even the benefits to the climate. So that's a good thing. But my magic wand has helped because some good news is the Detroit Public Schools is one of the schools that have been granted an award from the EPA, and they're going to be able to get 15 electric school buses. So think about all the uh, combustion or fossil fuel that won't be going into the environment because of those new electric school buses. So that's exciting news for Detroit and exciting because we know how um, um, badly affected the kids are by poor air quality in Detroit. So this is going to really help them. So that's good news. And then, the, you know, like we've all mentioned, the EPA regulation um, changing the, the, the PM to nine micrograms is really going to impact health in a great way. So these are the things we can continue and, and should keep. Um, pushing for and riding the coattails of so that uh, these changes that are really necessary to improve our our climate you know can can actually happen so it's good stuff happening we got to keep that momentum going Not happening around air quality it's 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 really amazing um so we have uh just about nine minutes left and wanted to leave some time for questions from um the audience um I don't know how we actually receive those questions. Uh, Monica, do you know? Do we have anybody that can raise their hand or submit a question? Put it in the chat. Okay. I think, yeah, I think anybody can put a question in the chat. Um, that, And then we'll all be able to see them. So... If anybody has any questions for any of our panelists today, throw it in the chat and we'll chat about it uh, on, on the call. Looks like we While we're waiting for those, I wanted to also mention that another great thing happening is the Inflation Reduction Act that right. the Biden administration got passed and legislation got passed recently. That's gonna impact health and climate because there's so many great incentives and rebates and such in that plan that will help industry and businesses and individuals move from this fossil um, 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 specific uh, environment into a green and an electric um, electrification environment. So right. that's another good thing. And June, June, do you have a, a black club? Yes, I'm the president. Air quality of black club. I'm the president of Winship Community Improvement Association. Uh -huh. we, I try, I do, not try, I do. I do, I, 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 I pair people with an organization called Echo Works. They get mm -hmm. furnaces, air mm -hmm. conditioners, hot water tanks, and we're trying to go to the new electric furnaces instead of the um, old furnaces and boilers. Okay, and we try to do uh, 
we do our weatherization. I'm also the secretary of Sinai Grace Guild. We have an organization. We do weatherization to homes in, our, in the Winship community area and the surrounding community with, around Winship. We do mm -hmm. weatherization. We do windows, furnaces, hot water tanks, central air. And we do that, repair their porches, their steps. We do things like that. We try to help them to stay in their homes and stay healthy and get rid of the mold and the mildew. And I also work with disaster recovery group, like I said before. Yeah. We are giving them, we do muck outs, we clean the basements out, get the mold and the mildew, we give them furnaces, boilers, hot water tanks, try to get them to go to electric hot water, uh, electric furnaces. There's a new thing with Echo Works. We paired up with Echo Works. Mm -hmm. so we do a lot in different, on both east, west, and south. I haven't got to the north yet. But we're working on it. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna second the some of these comments. They're saying that you are the mover and shaker. <laughs> oh, I did I did get that award for change maker. Yeah, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you got. <laughs> so a couple questions for Darren. Um, what what's the timing on the rest of the uh, Wayne County air monitors, and what would you need to expand just there to other parts of the country or more people in Michigan? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, start with the first. Um, I can put a link in here, but the uh, final, uh, the fully 100 stationary monitors will be up by the end of April. Um, so just in time for uh, the summer. Um, right now, we're in the process. Um, we kind of have our deployment. We had a lot of community input um, from our task force and also using public health data, some of the maps that you showed earlier on mm -hmm. um, to deploy through the 43 community. So um, we'll have a couple deployed here uh, next couple of weeks. We'll have then 25 and 25 with a full 100 will be deployed by the end of April. And in terms of what we need, um, just interest um, to expand within Michigan. Um, we're in uh, seven states across the U.S. Um, work with some tribal communities. Something also we didn't mention as well. There's so much tribal knowledge in this work, um, and, and and definitely encourage folks to reach out uh, to our neighboring tribes and and get those learnings and and how to make sure that we uh, make sure our climate and environment is sacred. Um, but um, yeah, if you're interested in bringing just air to your communities or reach out, we can figure out how to make it work. Um, we're in Kalamazoo, uh, Dearborn, and Grand Rapids, and obviously Detroit, um, and we continue to expand um, throughout the country, but yeah. Cool. I'm going to link for the Wayne County. You can sign up and just receive like updates. Okay. Uh, I'm not Great. sure if it reaches them, but I'll put the link there in the chat. Great. And we'll send that out. And then another question about beyond the HEAL program, is there, are there any other programs where folks can get uh, air filters um, for their communities, for their homes? There's not much going on right now. It's always dependent on funding, right? Mm -hmm. um, there was a huge um, um, grant funded program going on. And I think June's group is involved in some of it, but they had, I forgot the official name, but they had a, a 14,000 person wait list. That's how, you know, desperate some people, people wow. are around to try to get benefits from these grant funded programs. Mm -hmm. So right now I, I don't know of anything off the top of my head. So, you know, you can, um, keep in touch with us. And as we hear about grant funded programs, we can make that known to you or join HEAL and, and do the good work of learning more about your asthma and allergies and you'll get an air filter. Got it. Cool. And then um, I, I think, I don't know if a vet has a question, but she just wanted to say that she's uh, she works with the United Children and Family Head Start on Health Services, and she's seeing a lot of asthma on the east side that's not well managed. So what can those folks do or what can a vet do to try to help help those kids? Yeah, so please, the, the um, it's education, 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 because when we know better, we do better, right? That's a, a, a age old saying. So contact me and I'm happy to come out and do some classes to support the families, to, to um, get them in touch with resources that they need, make sure that they're visiting the right kind of doctor, getting on the right medicines, getting rid of triggers. Um, asthma is, takes a lot of effort to make better, but then, oh my gosh, once once all that happens and folks are feeling better, it's a great thing because that, that lasts. So our uh, phone number is 248-406-4254, or you can go to our website at afamish.org. Um, let me help you. And definitely we can do that. We have lots of great programs and services available. All right. Well, I'm just, I'm so appreciative to all of you for taking the time out today.